Hey, thanks for tuning in. I'm here with Timothy Atik, who's back with us, uh, continuing his Devil Wears series. Today, he's preaching on the Devil Wears Truth. Let's stick around afterwards for a brand new postscript, and let's tune into the message now. to see you. It's so good to be back at Faith Bridge for a second week in a row. I want to start just by telling you uh, that my wife, Catherine, has a twin sister whose name is Sarah. And uh, several years ago, I was a student ministry pastor at a church in Austin, and I asked Catherine and her twin sister to dress alike and to come to church. Because when you're a student ministry pastor, you play deep and meaningful games with students like, which one is my wife? Like, that's how you lead people to Jesus, is by trying to deceive them. And so here's what I did, is I got three contestants, three high school students, and I had Catherine stand on one side of the stage and Sarah stand on the other side of the stage, and I just had three different um, parts of the, the challenge. And so I started and I just looked at Catherine and I said, what's your name? And she said, Catherine Atik. And then I looked at Sarah and I said, what's your name? She said, Catherine Atik. And they looked alike and they sounded just alike. And then I told the students, I said, hey, there's times where I might say to Catherine, hey there, Catherine. And her response is always, hey there, mister. And so I said to Catherine, hey there, Catherine. She said, hey there, mister. And I looked at Sarah, I said, hey there, Catherine. She said, hey there, mister. And again, looked just alike, sounded just alike. And then for the last thing, I looked at Catherine and I said, I love you, Catherine. She said, I love you too. I looked at Sarah, I said, I love you, Catherine. She said, I love you too. And it got weird right there for me with my sister-in-law because we hadn't shared that type of moment before and we haven't to this day, but it just was weird for a second. But uh, after those three things where these three students watched Catherine and her twin sister do these three different uh, moments, I looked at the students. I said, okay, now which one is my wife? And it was so gratifying because two of the three thought that Sarah was my wife when she in fact was not. And it was, it was so gratifying. It was like, hey, welcome to church, high school students. You've been deceived. Jesus loves you. Please come back <laughs> next week. But the reason that I tell you that is because we're in this series that we're calling The Devil Wears, and I think about that story, and I think about what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and it has everything to do with what we're talking about today. Listen to what Paul says. He says in chapter 11, verses 13 through 15, it says, for such men are false apostles, deceitful word workmen disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it's no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, their end will correspond to their deeds. All the way back in the Garden of Eden, we have found that Satan is in the business of deception. That's what he seeks to do. He seeks to deceive his, uh, to deceive God's people. And one of the great ways that Satan deceives men and women is by having people on the inside of Christianity. He has men and women on the inside of the church who masquerade as agents of light and in reality they're seeking to lead people towards darkness. So what I'm telling you this morning is that there are Christian leaders and preachers and teachers and authors and movements and churches and Bible studies and conferences that fall under the umbrella of Christianity. And just like my sister-in-law, Sarah, they look like the truth and they sound like the truth. But just like Sarah was not my wife, there are churches and Christian leaders um, that appear to be uh, empowered by God and for God, when in reality, 
They're simply masquerading as agents of uh, righteousness when in fact they're leading people towards darkness and unrighteousness. And so the reason I'm even bringing this up is that we've been in this series that we're calling The Devil Wears, and each week of this series, we've been trying to identify a tactic that our enemy uses to steal, kill, and destroy in our lives. And so what I want to tell you today is that uh, just as we've looked and we've said that, you know what, the devil wears temptation, or the devil wears unforgiveness, or the devil wears deception, today I want to tell you that the devil wears truth. But this type of truth, you should just probably flip the R in the word truth around because this truth is a distorted type of truth. It's actually not truth at all. But what our enemy will do is he will use people on the inside of Christianity to lead people away from the Christ of Christianity. And so what I want to tell you is that you better be very discerning. And so let me just tell you, what you have before you today is you have someone standing right in front of you proclaiming what he believes to be truth. What you need to decide is if what I'm saying is actually true or not. If what I'm saying is not true, you probably shouldn't listen to me ever again, just for your own safety. But what I want to beg you to do is I want to beg you to begin to learn how to discern between what is true and what isn't. And what I wanna do is I wanna give you three reasons why it is essential that you can discern between what is true and what is not. The first reason that you need to be able to discern what is true and what is not is because Satan wants you to have an affair. And I just wanna be clear, I'm not talking about marriage right now. But you need to know Satan wants you to have an affair. If you have a Bible, I just want you to turn with me this morning to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. If you don't have a Bible, our ushers are coming forward and they can hand you one. But I just read from 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and I just want to get us all on the same page because that is where we're coming from this morning. Satan wants you to have an affair. Listen to what the Apostle Paul tells us in verses 1 through 3 of chapter 11. He says this, I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me, for I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. What I want you to realize is in the first century, um, engagement was even more significant than it was than it is today. And fathers of the bride felt a deep responsibility to get their daughters to their wedding day um, and still have uh, not lost their virginity. It was the the dad's responsibility to ensure the purity of their uh, daughters. And so uh, what Paul is doing is he's drawing off of that imagery and he's saying, look, I'm playing the role of the father of the bride. And so Jesus is the groom, church in Corinth, you're the bride, and your wedding day is the day that Jesus Christ is coming back for his people. And what Paul is saying is, I feel this huge responsibility to get you to your wedding day having not lost your spiritual virginity. I want you to get to your wedding day having had this sustained pure devotion for Jesus Christ. But I wanna tell you, church in Corinth, you guys are in danger. Because you have an enemy, Satan. And just as he was so effective in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve where he came to them and deceived them, you need to know that your enemy is seeking to deceive you. And the way that he's seeking to deceive you is by targeting your mind. And he's trying to distort truth and lead you away from what is right. And so I tell you that Because what Paul is saying is the enemy wants you to cheat on your groom, Jesus Christ. The same is true for you. What was true of the church of Corinth is true for you today. Satan wants you to have an affair. If Jesus is your groom and you are his bride, he wants you to cheat on Jesus Christ. 
And so I tell you that because you need to know that the enemy is going to target your thinking. And that's what Paul was warning the church in Corinth. He, he talked to them about their thinking. I grew up with a dad as a psychologist, which means I got free therapy all the time, and that was helpful because I needed a lot of it. But I remember my dad just telling me, he said, hey, Timothy, you need to know that what you think will determine how you feel and how you feel will determine how you act. And I tell you that because if you have an enemy that's targeting your thinking about Jesus, if he can distort your thinking about Jesus, then he can, di he can distort your feelings towards Jesus and your, your actions in your behavior for Jesus. He can twist and distort all of that. How does he do it? He does it through false prophets and false teaching. Listen to the words of 1 John 4, 1. It says, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. Do you hear that? There are many false prophets that have gone out into the world, and they're fueled by a spirit. It's not the Holy Spirit, but it is a spirit. And the reason that's so important to realize is because, because there are people in this world who are fueled by a spirit, that means that their teaching is very spiritual. And so your enemy wants you to hear spiritual teaching and be led astray by it. Let's just be clear. Satan's greatest goal isn't to make you an atheist. And his greatest goal isn't even to make you an agnostic. You need to know Satan has no problem with you being a spiritual person. He actually has no problem with you being a religious person. And he has absolutely no problem with you believing in Jesus. As long as your spirituality is the wrong kind of spirituality and your religion is the wrong kind of religion and your beliefs in Jesus are beliefs in the wrong Jesus. That's his goal for you. He wants you to have an affair. He wants you to commit spiritual adultery. He's seeking to lure you away from a sincere and pure devotion to Jesus Christ. And he will do it through the teachings of corrupted, distorted um, prophets and teachers. I think a good example of this is Aaron Rodgers, the quarterback for the Green Bay Packers. Let me just be clear, I grew up a Cowboys fan. And I know that that doesn't sit well here in Houston, we're, we're good, it's okay. But as a Cowboys fan, I cannot be a Packers fan. It, it, it just doesn't happen. But I do um, respect Aaron Rodgers because he, he really is one of the greatest quarterbacks to ever play the game. But Aaron Rodgers did an interview with ESPN Magazine. And Aaron Rodgers grew up uh, claiming to be a, a follower of Jesus Christ. And he was asked about his spirituality in this interview. And just listen to what he says in ESPN Magazine. He says, I remember asking a question as a young person about somebody in a remote rainforest, he tells me. Because the words that I got were, if you don't confess your sins, then you're going to hell. And I said, what about the people who don't have a Bible readily accessible? That's actually a really good question. The good news is that there's actually a good answer for that question, but I don't think Aaron Rodgers got it. It goes on, the article goes on and says, for years these concerns nagged at him, especially as he met more people from other walks of life, teammates who grew up in different parts of the world, friends with different religious backgrounds. He started reading books that delved into al alternate interpretations of theology. Then, not long after he became the starter in Green Bay in 2008, he met a young pastor from Michigan whom the Packers invited to speak to the team. When uh, the talk ended, Rogers waited for the group to dissipate and then introduced himself to the pastor, best known for his progressive views on Christianity. The two men struck up a friendship. The pastor sent Rogers books on everything from religion to art theory to quantum physics. And the quarterback gave him feedback on his writing. Over time, as he read more, Rogers grew increasingly convinced that the beliefs he had internalized growing up were wrong. 
that spirituality could be far more inclusive and less literal than he had been taught. As an example, he points to the pastor's research into the concept of hell. If you close read the language in the Bible, Rogers tells me, it's clear that the words are intended to evoke an analogy for man's separation from God. It wasn't a fiery pit idea. That concept was handed down in the 1700s by the Puritans and influenced Western culture, he says. The Bible opens with a poem, he adds. It's a beautiful piece of work, but it was never meant to be interpreted as I think some churches do. I ask him whether he still sees himself as a Christian, and he says he no longer identifies with any affiliation. Do you see what's happened? The greatest shaping force in the change in Rogers' beliefs was a Christian pastor and author. See, Satan wants you to have an affair. He wants to lure you away from a sincere and pure devotion to Jesus Christ. The second reason why it's very important for you to be able to discern between what is true and what isn't is because false teaching can sound a lot like the truth. False teaching can sound a lot like the truth. Listen to what uh, Paul says in verse four, chapter 11. He says, for if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying, hey, guys, you guys are listening to a talks about a different Jesus, and you're listening to talks that preach a different gospel. You're listening to messages that are fueled by a different spirit. The reason I even bring this up is it's very important to realize that people, there are a lot of outlandish messages out there, but there are a lot of false teachers that are talking about Jesus. And there's a lot of false teachers that are being fueled by a spirit, which means their talks are very spiritual. And there are a lot of false teachers that are actually proclaiming a gospel, which means that they have a message that sounds good. So I think it's important for you to, to just answer the question, who has your ear right now? Because we live in an age where podcasts are extremely popular which means that you can get spiritual teaching, you can get teaching about Jesus, and you can get teaching that proclaims a gospel every single day of the week. And there are, uh, I have no clue how many thousands of churches there are in Houston. And there are churches all over this city that are talking about a Jesus, and they are proclaiming a gospel, and they are fueled by a spirit, but they're not talking about the one true Jesus, they're not talking about the gospel and they're not fueled by the Holy Spirit. And so what I wanna just encourage you to do is to learn how to spot the counterfeits and I think the way to do that is by taking a page from the playbook of federal agents who have to recognize counterfeit money. How do federal agents recognize counterfeit money? It's not by studying counterfeit money, they do it by studying the real thing. And by knowing the real thing inside and out, because when they know the real thing, it's easy to spot the counterfeits. So if it is true that false teaching can sound a lot like the truth, then here's what I wanna do. I just wanna give you kind of four questions that can serve as criteria. Four questions that you should be asking to make sure that you can spot the counterfeits. The first question that I think that you should be asking and answering is this, how does a person or organization view and teach the Bible? It's a very important question to ask and answer. How does a person or organization view and teach the Bible? And here's what I'm about to do. I am about to flood you with scripture and points. I just need you to know that. So if you're a note taker, write quickly. If you're not a note taker, now might be a good moment to become a note taker, but I just want to tell you I'm about to open up the fire hydrant, so just be prepared. But here's what I really wanna do. Instead of just giving you my opinions, I just wanna let the word of God do the talking, okay? How does a person or organization view and teach the Bible? Well, what does the Bible say about itself? Listen to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. 
Paul says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those for whom you, from whom you have learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures. What are the Holy Scriptures able to do? They are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuke, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped in every good work. What does this tell us about the Bible? We could honestly spend an entire Sunday just on those few verses we just read. But I look at this and it tells me four things. Number one, that the Bible is the inspired word of God. It means it is God breathed. It's the, the image is of wind and the sails uh, of a sailboat. That God inspired or put wind in the sails of men who authored God's book. Here's what that means. It means that God put into the Bible and God got into the scriptures exactly what he wanted in the scriptures. It was inspired by him. It was God breathed. So what God wanted, God got in his Bible. It also tells me that if the Bible is God breathed, then it's inerrant. It means that it is without error in the original manuscripts. Now, uh, some of you guys uh, know the Bible and you know history and you're sitting there thinking, we don't have the original manuscripts and you're exactly right. But here's the good news is that we have tens of thousands of, uh, of uh, manuscripts that have allowed uh, historians and Bible scholars to put together what we have today. And Bible scholars believe that our translations uh, have uh, compared to the original manuscripts, we have been able to uh, reproduce uh, the Bible close to about 99.5% accuracy. In any textual variants which exist, which there are a lot, there is not one textual variant that actually alters any major doctrine of Christianity. So here's what that means. It means that what we have today can be trusted. This passage also tells us that the Bible is sufficient. Did you see what it says? It says that it is able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. It says that you may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. It's sufficient. It means that this book is what you need to know how to relate to God and live for him. You don't need a bunch of external sources. You have what you need. This book is sufficient. And it's also authoritative. If it is God's word, then it should have greater authority in your life than anything else. It's greater than what you feel is right. It's greater, what's, greater than what someone else says. If someone comes to you and believes that they have a word from the Lord, it could be from God. But if it contradicts this book, this book wins. It is authoritative. So if that's the real thing, then let's spot the counterfeits. Let me just encourage you. Don't be lured by anyone who says the Bible has been corrupted and that they alone have the only pure, accurate, or authorized translation of the Bible. I remember some people came to my door and we began to talk and um, we began to talk about the deity of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is God. And they, these people didn't believe that Jesus was God. And I know several people places in the scriptures where Jesus either claimed to be God or others, other people claimed that he was. And so what I did is I turned in their Bible, which was their translation written specifically by their organization, and I turned to one of the greatest proofs that Jesus claimed to be God. And in their translation, they had reworded the verse to remove the deity of Christ from it. That's a problem. That's a huge problem. So beware of anyone who feels like uh, all other translations have been corrupted except theirs. And let me just give you a word of advice. Anytime an organization or a church creates their own translation of the Bible, and they did it all in-house, like they didn't get scholars from around the world to help in the translation, be very, very, I'm skeptical of it because most likely they're just trying to push their own doctrine. I'll just tell you that there is a church in our country, a very well-known and popular church that puts out a lot of popular music that we sing. 
And they created their own translation of the Bible. And here, let me just read you what a member of the the NIV, the New International Version, one of the most popular translations of the Bible today. This is what a member of the NIV committee on uh, Bible translation said about this translation of the Bible written by this church. They said, it abandons all interest in textual accuracy, playing fast and loose with the original languages and inserts so much new material into the text that it is at least 50% longer than the original. The result is a strongly sectarian translation that no longer counts as scripture. By masquerading as a Bible, it threatens to bind entire churches in thrall to a false god. Don't be lured by anyone who has written sacred literature in order to add to the Bible or properly interpret the Bible. Anytime someone is saying, hey, we've written this book and this book is also divine and we need this book to truly understand this book, beware. Don't be lured by anyone who teaches that most or all other Bible believing and teaching Christians are false teachers. I remember coming to, the, coming to Houston and going to the Passion Conference. Here's, here's tens of thousands of people trying to go into the Toyota Center to hear about Jesus and worship Jesus. And there were these guys standing outside the Toyota Center yelling at everyone going in to worship Jesus, yelling at them saying, you're going to hell. And I was like, that's weird. <laughs> like these people are going in, like they're holding Bibles and they're walking in to worship Jesus. I'm like, you guys, what do you think is, what do you think this is? Like, did someone not notify you about what is happening? And here's the deal. These guys actually come from a church in Texas. These are guys who came up through a well-known university in our state. And what has happened is they have bought into the lie that their 200-person organization is the, the organization with real, true Christianity. And so... Other Bible-believing and teaching Christians are actually false teachers. Don't be lured by any teaching that clearly contradicts, bends, or simply ignores the scriptures. The, the teaching today is God is love. That's true. That's actually straight out of the Bible. God is love. But the problem is that love has been translated as approval. That God approves. God approves of anything. What's right for you doesn't have to be right for me, but if it's right for you, you know what God is love. Any lifestyle, any behavior, any decisions, you know what God is love. You know what? God is love. And God loves you just the way you are, but the reality is God loves you enough to not let you stay the way you are. That's true. Because the Bible says that We were by nature children of wrath. And Jesus Christ had to come. He loved us where we were at, but he loved us enough to not let us stay there. And so he died on a cross and rose from the dead so that we who were children of wrath could become children of God. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that um, we we have been made new creations. So Jesus is in the business of transforming us not just affirming who we are. Romans 8.29 tells us that it is God's will that we would be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That's his desire for us, to not just stay where we are. His desire is for us to look as much like himself as possible. Don't be lured by anyone who elevates experience over the word of God. I've got some good friends who wake up each day and they they interpret their dreams and think about the dreams that they had the night before. And I have, I have friends who, who love to receive words from God from other people and they love to share words from God with other people. And I don't see anything wrong with this. Here's the problem. My problem is when they elevate these things over studying the word of God. So the problem I have is the times when they have valued uh, hearing a word from God from a friend overhearing the word of God that has been given to us. That's the problem. So beware of anyone who will elevate experience over the word of God. 
The second question I think you should be asking because false teaching sounds a lot like the truth. The second question you need to ask is this, what does a person or organization teach about Jesus? I'll just tell you this, he was born of a virgin. That's Matthew chapter one, verses 18 through 23. He has always been and will always be God. John 1.1 1, 1 says this, in the beginning was the word. That's a reference to Jesus. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Here's what that means. Jesus isn't just a mighty spirit being. Jesus wasn't born and then slowly became God over time. Jesus isn't just one form of God. Jesus isn't one of multiple gods. Jesus is God and he has always been with God since before the foundations of the earth. It's the doctrine of the Trinity that God exists in three co-equal, co-eternal persons yet in one essence. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three yet one. There is only one God. Jesus is God. God the Father is God. The Spirit is God. There is only one God. Jesus is the way to eternal life with God in heaven. John 14, six, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Acts 4, 12, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus is extremely loving, Ephesians 3, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know the love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all fullness with God. He's extremely loving, but let's be clear, he is also just, which makes him a judge. Jesus is loving, he is also a judge. 2 Corinthians 5.10 tells us, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. There is no one more important than Jesus. Philippians 2 tells us, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So if that's the truth, then let's spot the counterfeits. Let me just encourage you, don't be lured by anyone who makes a path to heaven for everyone, no matter what they believe. I remember talking to a, to a ministry friend. It's actually a family member. And we were sitting there, we were talking about heaven and hell, and here's what he told me. He just said, hey, when I became a father, I just, I could not believe anymore that God would send someone to hell. So now he's more of a universalist. He just believes that everyone will ultimately get to heaven. It's kind of like a ski mountain. Like you might take one lift and I might take a different lift, but in the end, they all lead to the same place. Don't be lured by anyone who doesn't recognize Jesus as God. Jesus is not just a mighty spirit being. He's not. Don't be lured by anyone who doesn't recognize God as triune. God, I already said Jesus is not one of multiple gods. Don't be lured by anyone who only talks about the love of Jesus without ever talking about the judgment of Jesus. And don't be lured by anyone who talks about the judgment of Jesus without talking about the love of Jesus. Don't be lured by anyone who elevates certain humans to receive adoration that only Jesus deserves. The third question that I think you need to ask, because false teaching can sound a lot like the truth, is this, what does a person or organization teach about the Holy Spirit? Jesus tells us in John 16, 14 about the Holy Spirit. He says, he, that's the Holy Spirit, he will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Do you know what Jesus is telling us? He's saying, let me just tell you what the role of the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit's role is to glorify me, Jesus Christ. That's the role of the Holy Spirit, to glorify Jesus. And so if that's the truth, then here's what that means, that the reason that there is something called spiritual gifts and the reason that they're given to everyone who calls on the name of Jesus Christ is so that you can come and you can serve the body of Christ and the body of Christ will reflect Jesus Christ as much as possible because that's what the Spirit does. 
is it glorifies the Son, Jesus. So if that's the case, don't be lured by anyone who emphasizes the Spirit to the neglect of the Son, Jesus Christ. There are organizations, there are churches that are all about an experience with the Holy Spirit. And just to be clear, I, the Holy Spirit is God's gift to us and we get to experience supernatural things through the power of the Holy Spirit. But let me just tell you, that our goal this morning is not just to uh, experience the Holy Spirit. Our goal this morning is to see Jesus Christ clearly because of the work of illumination and conviction and regeneration that belong to the Holy Spirit. Don't be lured by anyone who emphasizes personal experience over corporate edification. I see this in college students at A&M that they are all about an emotional experience with the Holy Spirit. It's a personal experience, but the Holy Spirit has been given so that we can corporately edify one another, that we can come together as a body of believers and the Spirit can come move among us and we can be edified together and glorify Christ together. The fourth question I think you should ask because false teaching sounds a lot like the truth is this. What does a person or organization teach as the gospel? I don't need to give you my definition of the gospel. I don't need to give you my opinion of what it is. I can just read you the Bible because the Bible spells out what the gospel is. Here's what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 verses one through four. He says, now I would remind you brothers of the gospel. Great, Paul, thanks for reminding us because we're asking the question, what is the gospel? Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, in which, and by which you are being saved. So this is the truth that saves. He says, if in fact, if you hold, to the, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believe it in vain, here's what he delivered. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That's it. The gospel in its most pure form is this. Jesus Christ died for our sins, he was buried, and he was raised from the dead on the third day. That is the gospel. What that means is that salvation is by grace, through faith, in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If that's the truth, then let's spot the counterfeits. Don't be lured away by anyone who makes something other than the gospel central. I remember talking to a minister and he just said, you know what, in our church, there's the spiritual side of things and there's the social justice side of things. We're trying to swing things more towards the social justice side of things. That's a problem. The gospel is why the church exists. And so let me just be clear. Um, social justice is an implication of the gospel. It is. Like if we believe the gospel, if we're going to live out the gospel, then our lives will be marked by justice and we will fight for justice. But just to be clear, social justice is not the gospel. It is an implication of the gospel, but it is not the gospel. Don't be lured by anyone who says it's faith plus something. It isn't faith plus good works. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, for by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. It isn't faith plus baptism. I remember being on A&M's campus as a student and seeing these guys holding up signs saying that if you haven't been baptized that you're going to hell. That is not true according to the Bible. I love this story in Acts chapter 16, which the reason I love it is because people who claim that you have to be baptized to be saved point to the book of Acts for proof. But look at what Acts chapter 16 says. There's a jailer who asks a very important question to Paul and his friends. And here's his question. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Great question. That's the question. What do you have to do to be saved? Here's Paul's response. They said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household, period. Believe in the Lord Jesus 
and you will be saved, you and your household. Now watch verse 32, watch what happens. And they spoke to the, the word of the Lord to him and to, and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed the wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. I love that because it shows the importance of baptism. Baptism is always an appropriate response to salvation. And so if you haven't been baptized and you consider yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, I encourage you to take that step towards baptism. But baptism is a response to salvation. It's not a prerequisite for salvation. And just to be clear, it isn't faith plus speaking in tongues or demonstrations of uh, the supernatural gifts of the spirit. I had these girls come up to me after breakaway and they said, hey, we started hanging out with this Christian organization and what they told us is that we're not really saved if we don't speak in tongues. They said, what do you think of that? And I just said, I don't agree. And then I opened up my Bible and I read them 1 John 5, 11 through 13. Here's what it says. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Now watch this. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Do you see that? John just says, let me just, let's just get real. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. I'm telling you this so you can know that you have eternal life. And the gift of tongues is not mentioned once in the book of 1 John. I'm begging you to do what 1 John 4, 1 says. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into this world. Again, you need to evaluate what I am saying. Don't just believe what everything I say just because you, you've heard me talk a few times and you think you can trust me. Evaluate everything that I say. But let me just make a distinction. There is a distinction between false teachers and false teaching, okay? False teachers are, are those who masquerade in light, but they are actually agents of the evil one. False teaching is teaching that misses the mark. And I'm just gonna be honest, I would imagine that there is some time when I've stood on a stage and I've said something that's just a little off and I pray that God brings it to mind so that I could always make it right. But there are gonna be times when godly people who are seeking to handle accurately the word of, wrong, word of God get something wrong, but you need to evaluate and test the spirits. The third reason that I believe that you need to be able to discern between what is true and what isn't is simply this. Satan's servants can be very captivating and compelling. And I'm out of time, so let me just sum this up. Satan's servants can be very captivating and compelling. Just think, that's why 918 believers of the people's temple of the disciples of Christ drank poison out of obedience to their leader, Jim Jones. That's why 76 people died following David Koresh, who said he was the Lamb of God. Why? Because Satan's servants can be very captivating and compelling. So let me just beg you, do not value charisma more than character or content. Don't do it. Even people within the church need to be evaluated. It doesn't matter if they're funny or engaging or well-liked or best-selling authors or one of the most popular podcasts on iTunes. Satan's servants can be very captivating and compelling. They will tell you what you want to hear. But let's just be clear. You don't need to hear what you want to hear. You need to hear what you need to hear. I'll just... Uh, tell you this, there's a reason why I say yes to coming and speaking at Faithbridge, because I trust this place, and I love that I can go to Faithbridge website and there's a tab that simply says what this church believes. I love that, it's just spelled out, and it's lengthy, and I love that. Anytime something is too brief or too hard to find, that's probably telling you something. But your responsibility when you leave this place is to fight for truth 
and seek to discern it. I'll just close by saying this. I'll take you back to where I started with that who want, which one is my wife game. You know what? Kat and I have been married 12 years and I'm so proud to tell you that in 12 years of marriage, I've never once mistaken my sister-in-law for my wife. <laughs> yeah, it's impressive, isn't it? Thank you. Thanks for that encouragement. I'm really just doing what I'm supposed to do. But um, you, you, know, you want to know why I've never mistaken my sister-in-law for my wife? Because I know my wife. I've spent 12 years knowing my wife and studying my wife. And so it's incredibly easy because I know my wife to spot the one who isn't my wife. May the same be true for us as followers of Jesus Christ. May we spot what isn't true. Why? Because we passionately and ambitiously pursue that which is true. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, this is a lot. I know I just threw a lot at these friends here. But Lord, I'm thankful that your word speaks for itself and it can be trusted. And so I just pray, God, as, as we leave today, God, I just pray for a strong conviction, Lord, of what's true and what isn't. God, would you give us a more discerning, would you give us more discerning minds and hearts? God, may we trust your word. May we elevate you, Lord Jesus. And may we believe your gospel in its purest form that you, Jesus, the one who was and is God, left heaven, came to earth, died on a cross, you were buried in a tomb, and you were raised on the third day for the forgiveness of sins. We need you. We love you. Amen. You know, one of the things that I just so appreciated in T.A.'s sermon today was how he just gave us a frame for knowing here's, here's inbounds and here's out of bounds. And one of the reasons that I always get so heavy hearted when people step out of community and step out of church is because I know, oh my gosh, you're getting close to the boundary lines. Heaven knows who you're listening to and it's only a matter of time before people fall away. I'm so glad that you're here. I hope that you'll be back next week. We start the second quarter of this year. It's a big quarter. It'll involve Easter. It'll involve missions. It'll involve uh, seniors graduating. Second quarter year is a big quarter of the year. Let's be here. Let's be in community. Let's be in the truth. Let's be in the journey together. We'll start a new series next week that we're calling Ugly Instincts. We'll go back to Sermon on the Mount and take uh, a few interesting segments of that. See you next Sunday. Go in peace. Have a great week. You're dismissed. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. I'm Tyler Riley here with Timothy Atik, Executive Director at Breakaway, who just gave another sermon in the Devil Wears series. Today was the Devil Wears Truth. So, T.I., thanks for being with us yeah. here today. I always love being here. Yeah. Well, with it, I mean, we, of course, have some questions that some people have submitted, so I figured we could just jump right into it. Great. Let's do it. Awesome. So the first question says this. It says, I try to read the Bible, but struggle to understand what it's saying at times. Is there any book that you would recommend to help us in interpretation? Yeah, well, um, let me say first, before I recommend a book, let me just point you to community, just as Pastor Ken emphasized at the end of the and at the end of the service today, one of the best things you can do is get around other believers who are seeking to, to know the word and understand it and process the word of God in the context of community. That will be a huge help for sure. Um, a book that I think is um, incredible, 
was written by one of my seminary professors. It's written by a guy named Howard Hendricks, and the book is just called Living by the Book. And so it's an old book, but it is a great book on how to, how to study the Bible. That's awesome. Well, the second question uh, says, can you please name the organization slash church who's created their own translation? Yeah, I'm glad you're interested. I'm actually not going to name it just because the, the goal of the message wasn't to, to really take a shot at people and, and call out names. The goal of the message was just to to encourage people to be discerning. And so I would encourage you, uh, honestly, um, any translation of the Bible that you're going to use, go research it. That's a good thing to do. One of the things I don't want to do is, is just give people my answer to things. And so I'd, I'd encourage you to go out and do research on some of the more popular translations that are out today. And, and I'm, you'll, you'll probably come across it uh, soon enough. So sorry, I won't, I won't name it uh, to to everyone, but um, that will, that's not my goal is to to kind of pick people off, but to just help equip you guys to be able to discern what's true and what's not. Well, this one says, so the question still remains man's interpretation. The Bible is God breathed, but man's interpretation has divided us into so many denominations. If the gospel is central and they share that piece, but yet differ on doctrine, does it matter? He goes on to name um, different types of things, one even talking about slavery, and then he ends with, again, not about the gospel, but other views and rules that set the boundaries of our church. Yeah, good. Well, um, this is one of the reasons I love FaithBridge is because FaithBridge, in their doctrinal statement that they've put online, has been really good about... Um, differentiating between convictions and persuasions. And so the convictions are kind of like, this is non-negotiable. We will die on these hills. And then there's other things that are more secondary that the, the church feels strongly about, but could sit at a table with people who might not share the same belief and it'll be okay. And we would all respect each other as, as followers of, of Jesus Christ. I think you know, in the question, they clarified, you know, the, the clarification was kind of like assuming that we're on the same page about the gospel. I'll just say for me, when it comes to convictions, it, it has to do with, you know, the authority, the inerrancy of scripture, the deity of Christ, the, the triune Godhead, the depravity of man, um, salvation by grace uh, through faith. Those are kind of the big ones for me. And if we're not on the same page about those things, those are hills that I would die on. And I think that those are hills that um, that uh, Faith Bridge would die on. And then when it gets to secondary issues, now I would say slavery is not a secondary issue. That You can look at slavery and say there was a misunderstanding of Genesis 1, that all mankind has been created in the image of God. That was that was just a sinful, that is a sinful, that's an issue of sin, that's not a secondary issue. But you get into some of these other other issues that uh, are more secondary um, and very important, but the goal there is to go and study your brains out and go explore and examine and figure out where you stand, but knowing that your salvation doesn't hinge on it, your ability to love other people in the faith that might differ, differ, that your ability to love them doesn't, doesn't hinge on that either. Well, last question here. Uh, it says this, it says, I enjoyed the depth of your message today. These are questions I have often had for myself. In reference to baptism and salvation, what would you say about the verse Mark 16, 16 through 18, especially since this is supposed to be Jesus speaking? And I may be wrong, but the verses you referenced were all apostles speaking. I know we should be able to take all the verses into account. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, great question. And I would, I would just say that the apostles' teaching is very important because Jesus sent them out to speak on his behalf. So Jesus had his ministry, then he left and he said, I'm sending you the Holy Spirit that you are basically going to go out and do greater works than I've done. That basically his ministry has become their ministry. And here's the good news is that Jesus and the apostles are not uh, at odds when it comes when it comes to baptism. The 
The, the hard thing is that uh, there's times when people want to build a, a doctrine off of a few isolated verses. Um, and so for me, this is just me speaking personally, but the way that I try and operate is I don't try and build any major doctrine off of a few isolated in, uh, verses. What I want to do is I want to take what the scripture is saying from start to finish and always investigate difficult passages in light of the overall context. And so when you read uh, really all of the New Testament, what you would see is, I mean, you look at the book of John, what word do you see over 80 times you see the word believe? I mean, the majority of the New Testament is pointing toward uh, faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. So where does baptism come into play on verses like uh, Mark 16? Um, I, I do think that it is important to realize that faith and baptism always should go hand in hand. That when you have faith, you should have baptism. But it's not faith and baptism to be saved. It's that when you have faith, the natural next step is baptism. So you look in Acts chapter 8, and you see the Ethiopian eunuch, he believes, and his next question is, why can't I get baptized? And they're like, great, let's do it. And they stop right there, and they baptize him right then and there. So that, that's my personal stance when it comes to baptism, that I'm viewing things in light of, of the whole scripture. Um, and on those tricky verses like that, I would say that I don't think that it, they don't rattle me because I'm like, yeah, where there is faith, there should be baptism. And I think that we have done a poor job of letting there be separation that, you know, people can delay. And so you have people have been believers for years and they still haven't been baptized. So yeah. that, that's where I would land yeah. on that. Well, that's all the questions that yeah, we have. Great. Thanks for being with us today. It's always good to have you back. Yeah, thanks. Always and good to be here. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us for PostScript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.